long before you actually get the COVID or, or the HIV or any of the other viruses, because it is important that we understand the prevention. That is very, very important. When it comes to places in Africa, we leave it too late for people to be sick to go to the hospitals, because we know not everybody will have the means, the finances, the transport, the health facility. So you and I are our own doctors. We look after our own, own health. We're not leaving, don't leave it to the doctor or to the nurse or to the health center. You be your own doctor. Because if there's one message that you're going to be taking away from us today, it'd be that you'll be looking after your own health. Now, COVID, coronavirus 2019 or COVID-19 or the other name, which is um, SARS-CoV-2. COV-2 because we've already had a SARS-CoV-1, which was a SARS infection in 2003, I think it was what it was. Um, has come to us as a bit of a shock and a bit of a surprise and found that lots of us, especially in the Western world, because you might be sitting in Africa and thinking, oh, they are prepared in the UK or we are prepared in the US, but we weren't. We weren't. It caught us all by surprise. So now that it's caught us all by surprise, we've got to make sure that next time it happens, we are all nice and ready. Now, my other role, apart from being the medical director for um, Action Plus and working in the NHS, I actually also work as a coach, a trainer, and a speaker for the John Maxwell team. So teaching, training, and coaching, it's, you know, it's one of the things that I love to do. So this is a really a good area for me. I am really, um, I'm just excited to be here to have a chance to talk to you. If you've got some questions, I'll ask that you hold on to your questions till the end. Then you, when at the right time, and then you can ask your questions. Or if you can, if you're in a position to put your questions in the chat, will also be a good idea because it will give us a chance to think about it and see who the best person to answer the question will be. So we got, you know, we heard about coronavirus. They told us it started in China. There's a lot of debate about how it all started. Let's take it that started in China. Come January, February, we all heard about it. How much most countries were in lockdown. We were in total panic. We were afraid. There was so much news. Everywhere you turn to the UK 24 seven in the coronavirus and people are dying and people are dying and people are getting infected and this, that and the other. Believe you me, I am not making light of it because I'm frontline. I work in accidents and emergency and I saw death face to face. Most of you might have heard about it. Looking even at the figures before I came on, Apparently, there's no deaths in Uganda. I don't know how that, you know, how Uganda was able to not have any COVID deaths. I don't know. Where all the surrounding countries have all had deaths, apparently there's nothing in Uganda. So Uganda, if you're doing something, we need to know. I have seen it face on. But one thing I want to say to you is, whilst most of you would have heard about it, not too many people have seen people die of it. But the fear that coronavirus has engendered in the whole, whole world, those of us sitting here in the UK and users, we think we know it all and we are the bosses and we've got this and we've got that. Finally, we realize that only God is, you know, do you understand? We don't have control of our lives at all. It's only God. So what I want people here to realize is how important it is for all of us to be in the preventive, you know, put in place the sort of things that will prevent us from getting the infection in the first place or put into measures things that will help us fight the infection if we do get, God forbid, if we should get them. So we're looking at two prongs here. One, how to prevent yourself from getting the infection. Two, how to remain healthy so that if you are unfortunate enough to come into contact with somebody who um, you know, gets the infection, what you should be doing. Now, we are having time myself, so somebody's got to tell me when I've got five more minutes to finish, but I, I do apologize, I haven't timed myself. So two things. Now we all do know the message about, we, we, there's plenty of the myths there, and I think I'll leave it to some of my colleagues. I think one or two people will be busting some of the myths. All the people think it's not real, um, you can drink alcohol and that will clear it, and all that kind of stuff that's going on out there. For people who are thinking it's not real, here in the UK, more than 43,000 people have died of COVID. And all over the world, possibly a, a half a million, 500,000 people up, up to this point have died of COVID. So it is real. If you haven't seen anybody or you haven't heard, doesn't mean that it's out there. And my dear brothers and sisters, even if it is not real, 
the mental health consequences and the economic consequences, how it is going to affect our pockets, will be real. It is real, it is lasting. So just assume all the Western powers or all the governments, they are lying about COVID. Let's assume they are lying about COVID. One thing you cannot lie about is it will hurt you in your pocket because lots of people have lost their jobs or will lose their jobs. Lots of businesses are going to go under. The Western world, we are kind of standstill. We are only just beginning to open up. So it will affect you wherever when I'm sure it, it is affecting people already. So people think, oh, I don't know anybody who's got COVID, so I'm okay. It's hitting you in your pocket already. So pay attention to the advice that is going on out there so you don't get hit with your health ones. So we know about putting on the mask. Apparently in Ghana, it is a law. If you're going out, you've got to put on the mask. Put on the mask, cough into your shoulder. It's one of the campaigns. If you're going to cough, you're going to sneeze. Cough into, what, what did I say, shoulder? Forgot, not shoulder, elbow. Cough into your elbow. If you have to cough, cough into your elbow. We know about the hand washing. We know about the, this, uh, the social distancing. We know about the hand, tani, hand, hand sanitizers. I don't know how easy it is to get sanitizers. But hand washing is a must. If you go out and you come back in, wash your hands. Not just you, but you're educating the people around you, your family and your friends, and your, work, and your colleagues. And some of you here are leaders. So you're telling people, we cannot afford to get to the hospitals, but we can afford to not get sick. Or we can't afford to get to hospitals, but we can, have, you know, we can prevent ourselves from getting sick. So these are the ways in which we prevent ourselves from getting the disease. The other thing I want to hammer in on, and I'm sure my colleagues, the two HIV, and in fact, the three HIV experts on, on here will confirm the importance of keeping fit and healthy. Fit and healthy all the time and having a good immune system, period. If you've got a good immune system, if you keep fit and healthy, we know that. If so, for example, if you're fit and healthy and you get a COVID, you're more likely to come out of it better than if you, if you had, for example, we do know that people who've got diabetes are, you know, are higher risk of, of catching COVID. We know that people who have high blood pressure or other heart diseases are at a high risk. We also know that if people are a bit overweight, they're also at a, a higher risk. Now, I know that when it comes to high blood pressure and diabetes and heart diseases, it is very prevalent in our population. So if there's people out there, these are the areas you need to be controlling. If you've got these conditions, don't say, oh, the doctor is talking too much or they're giving me too much medication or whatever. It's in your interest to try and control those things. If you've been given medication, you take them. If you haven't seen your healthcare provider in a while to see how your sugar is doing, how your blood pressure is doing, you need to do that. General health advice, general health uh, you know, advice for all. You want to be as fit and as healthy all the time so that when you get any infection, including COVID, you can fight it. And I'm sure the age, like I'm saying, my other colleagues will agree on this one. Now, the, what I want to say is there's so, many treatment, there's so many treatments being tried for COVID here in the UK and the US and all the advanced nations. They're thinking of some of the anti-malaria tablets that you and I have taken for malaria for a long time. And, some, and these are cheaper options to treat um, COVID. There are other, other issues as well, which maybe it's happening in, in your part of the world. I don't know. There's treatments. Lots of people are waiting for a vaccine, something that we can have. I don't know whether it's going to be an injection or a tablet to prevent, um, to prevent COVID. Loads of hospitals are working on it. Loads of government um, organizations, science lab, research, plenty of universities, all the drug companies are rushing to get a vaccine for COVID. But it's not something we're going to be getting very soon because all that is coming out is all being rushed through. And I'm sure you've heard about the controversy. They're saying they want to try some of these vaccines on people in Africa, and there's a big uproar. And here in the UK, they're even suggesting that they try it on us ethnic minorities here. And it's again an uproar. One thing I can say is if we find a vaccine today, and we're not even sure, because HIV, we've been look, waiting for a vaccine for a very, very long time. We haven't got it. But COVID, everybody is rushing to get a vaccine. If we do, the vaccine will be so expensive 
That's one. Two, they have to produce a lot to cover almost the 7 billion people on planet Earth. Believe you me, my people in Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Uganda, everybody else will be the last people to get it. Because one, it will be too expensive, two, there will not be enough. So let us not rely on COVID and um, um, vaccines or the medication, but let us rely on ourselves and, be, and, and have control of the things that we can control. Your health, it's your wealth, it's your number one asset. If you've got no health, forget about the money. Forget about this and forget about that. Your health is number one. So take the, the preventative uh, measures that we're going to be discussing seriously. Take it to heart. Learn it for yourself and tell your family and friends. Your immune system, very important. You've got to boost your immune system. You've got to eat right. You've got to eat healthy. Plenty of the fruits and vegetables. Luckily, you've got them where you are. Fresh fruit, fresh vegetables. Plenty of water. They're thinking the garlic, the onions, the, the mushrooms. I've got a list here. Uh, citrus fruits, vitamin C in your citrus fruits, the oranges, the tangerines, the satsumas, all that kind of stuff. Very good because you're boosting your immune system. You need that number one. I'm stopping here just a minute so you can think about it. Don't wait for the doctor. Don't wait for the nurse because there's just not enough nurses and doctors going around. And if there is, there's not enough medicines going around. And by the time it gets to you or to most people, it's a bit too late. So be your own doctor. Look after yourself. Keep fit. Keep well. Walk as much as we can. I know when I come to Ghana and I'm walking, they say, hey, don't walk. If you're a doctor, if you walk, people will think that, you know, why is a doctor walking? She's poor. That's why she hasn't got a car. That's why she's walking. Please. Your health is number one. I know some people are still in lockdown and can't go out, but when the time comes and you can go out, the short distances that you can, please walk. Take the children, have a walk. Play the football with your children if you're in that position. Play the games with your children. Put on a, dance, a music, a nice gospel, and just dance and break sweat. Get going, get active, because you are boosting your own health. You're boosting your own immunity. I know you lot, when you go to church, you dance. Here in the UK, they're going to ask us to not sing when we go to church. Because if you sing, apparently, you emit a lot of the viruses. In fact, they're not going to ask us. They've actually told us churches are still locked down. I don't know when they're going to ask us to go back. When we go back, I don't know whether they're going to ask us to sing or not. In fact, they're going to tell us not to sing. They have told us not to sing. Because we emit a lot of the viruses. But you can do that in your own home. Do your singing. Do your dancing. Do your keep fit. Do your gardening if you've, you have that, you know. Do the things that will keep you fit and active and get the immune system primed up. So that if an unfortunate situation that you come across, you come across the virus, that you're already fit. Because we know when people are fit, if you have to go and have surgery, if you have to go into hospital or whatever, you do better because you already went in fitter than, than before. So please, my advice, Although I'm a doctor, I'm very, very community-based because I've, I've had a lot of my, my working life in the community. We have a lot of power to change our circumstances on the community and not wait for the health professional because they may not be there. So many doctors and nurses died here in, this, um, in the UK and in Italy and in the US. So many died. I don't know how many have died on your end. But colleagues, people like me in my age, mate, Black, African, Nigerians, 50s, 60s, people in the prime of their, of their profession died of COVID. Anybody can die of COVID. In the US, lots of people die of COVID. The poor especially died of COVID. Here, the doctors died. We couldn't understand what they did, and they still are. So please, so many things about COVID we don't understand. But the way in which we prevent ourselves from having COVID, we do understand. So we've got to work on that. And to work so that we, we have our, the nutrients to boost our energy, we've got uh, control over that. We do understand that. We've got control over that, and we've got to, we, we, we've got to do that. So now, um, I'm just looking at my notes. Just give me two seconds. I'll make sure I've covered everything. OK, now, just one other thing. We do know, because that was the message, that COVID, it's cough. You're coughing. You've got temperature. You've got, you're, you're not breathing well, or you're having problems breathing. But we also are realizing now that there's other symptoms of COVID that people have got to bear in mind. For example, you lose a sense of smell. 
or a sense of taste. Or for example, you get loose to like diarrhea, you're going to the toilet a lot more often, or stomach pains, or feeling sick and being sick. These are all newer type of um, um, symptoms of COVID. I'm not saying that when you get this, it is COVID, but when you're beginning to see some of these things, at least have that at the back of your mind as well. Okay, now, um, okay, let's make sure I've got it all right. All right. Now, I also want to talk about, because some people do, some people don't, talk about maybe vitamins and other things you can have. If you've got access to them, vitamin C, which you can get your fruits, it's fine. Vitamin C, vitamin D, it's all known to be very good. Vitamin D in particular, we of dark color tend to, you know, suffer, a, you know, we lack a bit of it, of vitamin D because of our color. So if you can get vitamin D, you can take, you can take that. It's not a must, it's just a preventative thing. But fruits and vegetables, is, it's very good. Okay, so now, uh, okay, right. So I think I've covered all the bits. I know I've said a lot because I had 20 minutes. I don't know how much I've got. I know I've said a lot and I'm available for questions. Um, hold on to your questions. You can write them down, you can put them in the chat. And then I will we'll be moving on to the, uh, the, 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 to the next section of our, of our program. So if you hold on a bit for me, I'd like to introduce to you the next two speakers, two colleagues based here in the UK, experts in their, in their area of work. Um, like um, Apostle said, you've got a lineup of people who know what they are talking about and they are passionate about what they are talking about. So the first lady here is Miss uh, Madame Beatrice Nabulia, and I do apologize if I've got the pronunciation of your, your second name wrong. So Madame, oh, thank you. So Madame Beatrice is a proud mom of four and a dedicated community advocate in the area of HIV and sexual health. Okay. And she's got, and for the past 20, and she's done that for the past 25 years. So she's not, she's not a novice. She knows what she's talking about. Currently, Madame Beatrice works with um, Positive East, and that's a big HIV um, charity here in the UK. And as HIV prevention and testing coordinator, she'll be sharing some lessons from her experiences, her HIV experiences that could be useful in dealing with our, our, our current situation. Now, the next lady is Madame Gloria, Gloria Ob Obon Odongo. Obongo? Ob Odongo. Sorry, I will get the names right eventually. So Madam Gloria is born in Kenya, has lived here in the UK. Um, and Madam Gloria has a wealth of, of experience working with people living with HIV abroad and within England. So without much ado, I'd like to introduce my two cl colleagues, Madam Gloria and uh, Madam Beatrice. Now, I don't know who's going to be uh, talking first, but I shall... Who is it? Is it Beatrice? You're coming first or Gloria? Okay. Gloria. Okay, so Madam Gloria is going to be coming first. So um, yes, let's have all ears for Madam Gloria. Okay. Hi everyone. I'm just going to um, share my screen and go through um, a few slides. So just give me one moment. Um. Yeah. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep. Yes. Excellent. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Evelyn. Um, so I'm just going to go through uh, a bit about the organisation we work for um, and our experiences working um, in HIV and how it, is quite, it, it can be seen as similar to the response to COVID-19. So this is our vision as, um, at Positive East. We're an organisation based in East London and we support people living with and affected by HIV. So we have a vision um, where a, a world full of people um, living with HIV are able to fill their potential, free from stigma and discrimination, living full and healthy lives. Further, we wish for a world where the onward transmission of HIV is eliminated. So these are the services we offer. So we offer information and guidance. So um, people living with HIV can be referred to ourselves and we can support them with um, things like benefits, um, discrimination at work, um, 
housing and things like that. So we also offer peer support. So peer support is where somebody living with HIV, um, newly diagnosed, is partnered with somebody who's been living with HIV uh, for a longer period of time. And they can support them with things like um, medication adherence, um, if they'd like to disclose to family and friends how they can go about that. We also offer counselling, so people who are newly diagnosed or who may have, you know, lived with HIV for a while may have issues with coming to terms with their, um, with living with HIV, so we can support them through that. So we also have therapeutic services, so these include things like massages, um, you know, and different kinds of um, holistic approaches. Um, health and well-being, I mean, at the minute, obviously, we're still in a lockdown here in the UK. So we have an online system, we have an online um, program where we offer things like um, dance classes, we have cooking classes online. Um, so we've got a variety of support that we can also give in terms of health and wellbeing. Prevention and testing, me and Beatrice both work in the prevention and testing team. So we go out in the community and um, test people in the community. We talk to local, the, the community about how to prevent them how to prevent themselves from acquiring HIV um, and as I said before yeah we test in the community as well so we test in churches we test in GPs we test in libraries so we test in a variety of community settings so lessons from the HIV response as professionals working on the front line of HIV um, of HIV prevention, we've seen quite a lot of similar similarities between the way we've responded to HIV and the ways in which we can respond to COVID-19. We have an amazing colleague called Dr. Renee West. She developed something she called the seven C's. And these were seven principles that were used um, in the response to HIV. And we've seen them and looked at them and we, we feel like a lot of them can be applied when responding to COVID-19, especially in the Black Africa, the, yeah, the BAME community. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the C's and then Beatrice will follow on with the rest of them. So community. Um, we've recognised the importance of involving the community in the response. We have to engage with the people who have experienced, who've been affected and infected um, by COVID-19. Um, the same way we test in places um, that people need it most. So the same way with HIV, we test in the community with the groups that need it most. Um, that's the same way we're looking to do it with COVID-19. I'm not sure if people are aware, but in the UK especially, um, the BAME community has been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 in the same way that, you know, the Black African community was disproportionately affected um, with HIV. So we need to see, when, I mean, when we're talking about community work, we need to make sure that people are seeing faces that look like them. When we're talking about, um, when we're talking about, when we're talking to people about COVID-19, we need to make sure that we're talking, people who are talking about it are also from those communities. So in our response to HIV, we also have um, community uh, engagement workers who are their community members who have learned a lot about HIV and also can go back into the community and share that message with other people. Um, yeah, so the next one is communication. So I know not everyone here is in the UK, but right now we're really struggling with the message on COVID-19. Our government hasn't been too clear about what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. People are unsure, should I be doing this, should I be doing that? So we feel that there needs to be a strong, decisive and, and unambiguous response. I mean, right now they've got this whole thing called staying alert and people are getting confused because it's like I'm staying alert to what I can't see the virus. So how am I staying alert? I mean, there's also confusion about things like, um, you know, they've recently opened um, all the shops so people can go shopping, but there's still um, a lack of clarity around social distancing amongst like family and friends. So if I can meet my friends in the shop, but I can't meet them in the house, you know, people are quite confused about, you know, the difference and things like that. Um, I mean, there's also important of, in, of education. So as Dr. Evelyn was, you know, very clear with earlier, you know, if you're going to sneeze, if you're going to cough, do it into your elbow. You know, we need to make sure that people are aware of how it can be transmitted and how it can't. In the same way, you know, in the early days of the HIV response, people were unsure of how HIV was transmitted. People used to get scared that if you go close to somebody, that you can get it through you know, skin to skin contract. Um, we also need to make sure that people have the message of reassurance. 
COVID-19, not everybody with COVID-19 will pass away. So people need to know that even if you are, even if you do contract COVID-19, you have a good chance of, um, of, of surviving and getting better, you know, and continuing to live a full and healthy life the same way we, you know, we'd give the advice of HIV. So context, as I mentioned previously, in the UK, COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting um, BAME communities. I read a report a few days ago and it said the reason why BAME communities are disproportionately affected, well, this isn't all of the reasons, but these were a few. Um, they said it's because BAME people have a higher risk of um, living in overcrowded housing. And they have a higher risk of living in deprived, in deprived housing. They have jobs that expose them um, to COVID-19 more. So this may be working in hospitals. This, um, I'm generally, it's generally key work. So I know a lot of hospitals have cleaners from the BAME community, for example. So in that role, they're on the front line. And I know um, a lot of BAME communities have complained that they don't feel that they have adequate PPE. So they feel like they don't have adequate protection while going out and, you know, and carrying out their roles. Um, so commitment, we need a high level of commitment from COVID, um, about, sorry, from our government, you know, about, about COVID-19 and how we're going to deal with COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 has been politicised and that's because it affects all areas of community. So it affects, um, sorry, our society, it affects health, it affects the economy, it affects society as a whole. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people have never experienced, you know, uh, a, 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 a virus like this that affects, you know, every single part of us. Um, I mean, if you look at the way Trump talks about COVID-19, I've read that he called it the Chinese flu, he's called it Kung flu. Um, so, you know, you can, some of the governments can be accused of not taking it seriously enough. Um, and I mean, if in the UK especially, a lot of people are arguing that it's too soon to open things like, you know, shops um, and for things to go back to normal. But it's seen that because it affects the BAME community, it's not taken too seriously. You know, in America, I know Reagan struggled to talk about HIV until it, you know, until it killed a bigger number of people. People don't take it seriously until it's affecting their community. Um, and right now the BAME community is the ones being affected. So. I, you know, there's a bit, people can argue that there's, that's why, you know, people are, the, the government are eager to open things because they're not seen as that big an issue yet. Um, but yeah, that's some of the C's. I'm now going to pass you on to my, uh, my colleague Beatrice. Could the host allow me to share my screen, please? Um, I'm not, I can't, I don't think I can change it. Can you see mine? I'm not sure. Because I've just put the next slide. Okay, keep it on. But if you don't open that, um, sync. Okay. Gloria and Beatrice, is it the same slide? Um, well, slide? yeah, they're, they're the same. And well, I was going to open my one own. Oh. And one can talk? Sorry? So maybe one can change the slides whilst you talk. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's a great honor. Continuing on from the the seven C's that Gloria has started with regard to following the the uh, the pandemic, the COVID versus the HIV. I think we've learned a lot of lessons from having to deal with the epidemic for over 30 years. And I think when, when we talk about changing face of the epidemic, there's a, we are lucky there's a, a lot of information coming out, but like Gloria said, it's kind of a bit confused. But also, and the same thing kind of happened with the HIV, but at least now with HIV, it's more stable, and we are in a, bit, a better place. We actually have more knowledge. But what is lacking with the HIV is the knowledge within the communities. We do have the basic facts and all that, but okay, there's still some myths and misconceptions, but then in terms of education and awareness within the communities, it's still a problem because it's held back by the stigma. But with the COVID, we're seeing a lot of like um, interlinked scientific collaboration and the philanthropic collaboration from communities, which is very encouraging, but we still have a long way to go 
because we're still covered with the myths and misconceptions. So if we keep that going, it means that it will be a lot easier to manage. We have to keep the energy and it's very good that Apostle provides us with the opportunity to be here today. And then when it comes to uh, one of the lessons around compassion, with the, having worked in the HIV sector for a long time, one of the most difficult things to deal with with the HIV, and I think why we still have it as a problem, has been with a lack of compassion. Those who have been found to have to be living with HIV or have, be, uh, have AIDS have been treated in a very in a, without compassion at all. They've been stigmatized and judged because of uh, based on like their sexual behavior and all that, which is not really a very nice thing. So learning from that, we need to employ some emotional intelligence whereby other than judging people, we manage our own emotions and help other people to manage. If someone is living with HIV, do not put the blame on them, but give them the help, help them to go and seek the, the treatment they need, help them to go to get the emotional support that will keep them away from probably um, developing some mental health problems, or maybe if they need treatment of people who need to go and test as well. So those are some of the things we need to do. And uh, to get in addition to that, the collaboration is a major thing, as Gloria said, uh, with communities. I think for me as a, an African person, I'm originally from Uganda. It's one of the beauty of the things we have. We are a very closely linked community. So if we build on to that, we can fight all these epidemics and try to find ways so like uh, the doctor has been telling us, some of them are like ways about what you eat, the exercise you do, and all of us working together and checking in on each other. I think when we do that, it's going to make a very big, a very big difference on how we progress with the COVID at the moment. And in addition to that, with regard to the HIV, we need it because with the HIV, we have all the answers. But then what we lack is the knowledge around it and the acceptance. Next slide, please. Are you able to open that? Um, I don't think so. Okay, never mind. Okay. I know some of these, uh, talking about one of the similarities within the, the the COVID and the HIV is around the prevention bit because we're here now, it's very important that we're actually having the education because education is important. One of the things that never happened with, especially within uh, black African communities with regard to the HIV, many people shunned away from the knowledge and it took very close people like what Apostle Fred has been doing with the, regards to the epidemic to go out and try and reach the people. But people are saying, oh, I don't want somebody to see me looking for information. If we do that for the COVID, instead of being able to actually stop it in a year, two years or do that, it's actually going to be here forever. We're still having problems with the HIV despite having all the means to actually end the epidemic. So we have the thing that the doctor has mentioned about wearing a mask, sanitizing, social distancing, self-isolating, and then testing, tracking, and treating. But with regard to that, maintaining good health is very key to both of them. And in the, say, in the similar manner for the HIV, the problem we have is that people do not want to take an HIV test because they'll be seen in a certain way. They're going to be seen as people who sleep around, or others will say, oh, I'm not gay. We actually have U equals U, which means that if somebody's on HIV medication, and they've been taking it and their viral load is undetectable, they're not going to infect another people. With regard to that, we have a responsibility to see the end of the epidemic so that the children, I've seen many children on, uh, on, with us here today. Do we want our children to be facing these problems? That's where we need to line up as a community and make a very important impact in terms of ending this. So we have all this, the, treat, the, the treatment you take, PEP, is treatment you take after exposure, and then there's one you take before exposure. 
and making sure also that people have safe sex where it is necessary. And in bringing all that um, together, I just wanted to share with you 1 Corinthians um, 13, which talks about love. One of the things I have seen with the COVID approach is the unity that's been shown. People have come in together in a very philanthropic manner, in a very, you know, bringing all the scientific knowledge, but at the same time showing that love and care for individuals. Despite all like the labeling is from uh, China and all that, but still I've seen people like donating food bags and going out to visit friends and taking risks. I think we need to have that. We did not have that with the HIV. It took a whole 20 years before the World Health, the, the, the international community got together to actually fight, do something about the epidemic. And it's good that at least with the COVID it's different. But then all of us on the ground, we actually have a more impactful influence. It's one of the lessons from HIV that most of the work and the impact is when you work with the communities on the ground, which is very good and why this session today is actually very important. Corinthians 1 says, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but I have no love, I have become sounding brass or a, a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have no love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have no love, it profits, it profits me nothing. I'm not going to read it all up to the end, but I'll conclude with that. And now I abide, abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. I think in, in our, uh, facing this challenge with the COVID, the one thing that we need to retain, the one thing that we need to retain to, we need to enforce is the love for one another. Let's take away the judgment and make sure that we join hands together as a community, as a family. If somebody is infected, remember that what is at your neighbors will also be on your door tomorrow. So if we remember that and remember that uh, God is the love that God shows us, we are going to be able to, to fight and win this challenge that we have. And of course, in addition to that, we have the activism, people who stand up and and, and uh, um, fight for, for from different levels in terms of where resources are not there, like the work that our person does already or our charity and all that. So we need to, to support more and more of that. But all that will only be impactful if at the ground as a community, as individuals. For me, I look at this as an individual battle. Every single one of us has a role to play. And it's very important that we actually take on that you may think that it might be small or limited, but there's nothing like small or limited. It is actually going to have a big impact. Thank you, Gloria. Next one. Um, this slide is just showing that look, Gloria has already um, shown you the work that we do at Positivist except that I have one thing that I wanted to show you. Just give me a minute. Oh, I can't share. It's fine, I can't share my screen. <laughs> it's okay, Beatrice, Gloria. Beatrice, I can share mine again. I've just got the poster up. You got it? Okay. Yeah, whatever. Um, sorry, one moment. Here it is. Yeah. When I talk about activism, I am, as you can see there, I'm a person living with HIV. Not only have I been working in this sector for like 25, 20 something years, but I've been living with the HIV for over 25 years. So when we talk about activism, 
we need to be visual. And this is part of my passion is to sharing my story with other people because the reason we haven't been able to fight the HIV virus is because people like myself have been given labels. People have been ostracized, people have not been listened to, people have been ignored and they died when they shouldn't have. And on the other hand, those people, if everybody goes today and has an HIV test, it means that they are not able to pass on the virus to somebody else. Myself, I'm undetectable, which means that my virus is controlled, so I'm not, I'm not going to pass on the virus to anybody else. But our people do not actually know that. So we need to educate ourselves, at least to protect the future generations, but also for those be there to support at Positivist, we offer peer support. And at the moment for us, Gloria and I work with the prevention team. We are looking at like expanding and carrying out our work in terms of promoting testing. And when we do that, we're able to, to reach out and encourage people. It's been proven that if somebody has, there are many people who have HIV and don't know it, and that puts them at higher risk of getting COVID. Yes. So please remember that if you're shying away from testing, I'm believing proof that you can be HIV positive and lead a normal life. The only thing that happens is that you have to take medication. HIV is not a death sentence anymore. The medication is very effective. The problem we have is our ignorance. So please join, join me in the fight. I put myself out on social media to try and tackle the stigma associated with HIV because the same stigma is associated with the COVID as well. When we bring stigma in all these conditions, we're never going to win the battle. So thank you very much for um, everybody. Me introducing Yasmin? Yes. <laughs> okay. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Yasmin Dunkley, but currently based in South Africa, and she's a public health consultant working out of South Africa. At the moment, she's, we have the pleasure of having her as a manager for the prevention and testing team at Positive Vest. So with much pleasure, I would like to hand the floor over to Yasmin. Who's going to be talking to us about mental health. And Hi, everyone. I'm just Hello, waiting Yasmin. to share my screen. Um, Gloria, if you're able to share the host. I just want to say, Beatrice, that was incredible. Thank you so much, and Gloria, for, for sharing that. I mean, I was clapping and, you know, <laughs> singing your praises here on mute. I thought that was absolutely incredible. So thank you so much for sharing your story. Gloria, are you able to make me host so I can share my yeah, screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Excellent. So I'm here today to talk to you about good self-care in a time of COVID. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, you see. So uh, thank you so much to, to all of the former speakers, Dr. Evelyn, Gloria, Beatrice, for your, for your session so far. I think one of the important things to think about at this time is not just about COVID and the virus, but also about how we can look after ourselves at this time. I'm just letting people in at the same time as speaking to you. So sorry, I don't know if I can multitask. So self-care is about how we look after ourselves at this time. And I think one of the important things to recognize is just how difficult it is actually at this time, the gravity and the unparalleled nature of this situation. For many of us, this will be the first time that we have lived through something of this seriousness and of this gravity. And uh, as Beatrice said, um, I'm speaking to you from South Africa. So I've got a quote here from Phil Ramaphosa, who's our current president. When he first told us about the lockdown, 
he said that as a nation, we have been forced to take aggressive action against an invisible enemy that threatened our lives and the lives of our loved ones. And I think this idea of coronavirus and its parallel with war is actually really helpful when we start thinking about the mental health impact of the virus, the mental health impact of the lockdown, and also about how we can look after ourselves at this time. Coronavirus is like a war, and war is by its very nature a traumatic experience. So what do I mean by trauma? So psychological trauma is damage to the mind that occurs as a result of a distressing event. And there is no doubt that what we are living through collectively as, as a world is a distressing event. When we look at some of the things that come along with war, when we think about the, the terror and the horror that can be spread by conflict, some of the physical implications include death, injury, malnutrition, illness, disability. And some of the psychological aspects include anxiety, depression, and emotional effects. We see war disrupting lives, severing relationships and families. So sorry, I'm just going to uh, mute you lovely people have been asked to. Somehow. Brilliant, thank you. And I think actually, Dr. Evelyn, you said it best when you were talking about the fear of the virus. And I think for many of us, especially those of us who are, who are in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, we can see what's happening in Europe and we can see what's happening in, in America. But actually, in many of our countries, we are not yet at the same place. We're months behind in terms of the epidemic. And fear is kind of, it's the second epidemic. We sit there on social media and we see the news and every day, we see um, this number of people infected, this number of people have died. And that in and of itself is a contagion. Then we watch this news and we feel that fear and we spread on that fear. And so just like war, my argument is that coronavirus is a traumatic event and it's a triggering event. We see it with fake news and the myths that come out and the misinformation we see it with the ever-changing story. You know, today we hear that there's a new treatment and that's fantastic. And then another day we hear that there's a new vaccine and that's great news. But then we hear maybe the vaccine doesn't work. Maybe Africans are being used as guinea pigs, which is something that Dr. Evelyn spoke about in her presentation. And all of this changing information, this conflict, these bereavements. I mean, for many of us, my husband recently was in an accident and he was taken to the hospital it was a road traffic accident and I couldn't be in the hospital with him because of coronavirus. And that's, that's now many of our experiences. And when we see loved ones going into hospital and we can't be with them, or when people that we are very close to pass away and we are unable to attend their funerals, this is all of it extremely distressing and triggering. And I think it's so important for us to recognize this because in the same way that I'm saying coronavirus is like a war, these real life impact there'll be a real life impact in terms of our mental health. And I'd just like to share a little bit about the physiology of what happens when we are stressed. So our, all of us have a brain and when we are put under acute stress and acute pressure, what happens is our amygdala, this little bit here that uh, you can see in this, in this silhouette's brain is activated. And this is our survival response. So when we're in situations of extreme pressure, our thinking shuts down to a reptilian response, to our survival response. And in that situation, we will do one of three things. We will flight, we will fight, or we will freeze. And I think this is what we see. So when you see um, in the aunties in the shop and they're fighting for toilet paper, this is your fight response. This is people who are under situations of extreme stress and they are triggered and they are fighting. Other people flight. Maybe they will run away from even discussing coronavirus. Um, maybe they will move out of the city. 
For others, maybe it will be freeze. Maybe they'll be unable to work or unable to engage at the same level of activity that they were engaging at before. And all of this is a completely natural and human and biological response to stress, acute stress. And we can look just in the short term at what this level of stress can do to the body. So you know when you feel stressed, your heart pumps harder, you sweat, you can have tummy issues. In the long term, that can lead to mental health problems. It can lead to digestive problems. It can lead to tension headaches and migraines. So when I say that we should think of coronavirus like a conflict, like a war, it's to recognize actually the severity of the implications on us physiologically. Now added to that, we have, at the same time as this pandemic, we have the twin epidemic that we have seen where Black Lives Matters and other movements have demonstrated structural racism and people are fighting in the streets. As members of Black and minority ethnic communities, we see the impact of structural racism when it comes to conversations about mental health, because we see it in many different ways. You can see it in these racist tropes and these stereotypes and stereotypical ideas about the strong black woman who she can't complain, she must just continue, she must persevere, she doesn't have issues with mental health. Or we even see it in the provision of mental health services. So for example, I've worked in the humanitarian aid sector and you will see there's a huge divide, and I believe it's structurally racist, between the level of mental health support an international worker will receive, pre-deployment counseling, counseling when they're on deployment in many of our countries, versus locally employed staff, brown and black people, will not receive the same level of mental health support. And the argument often is that locally employed people will have access to other resources, and I think it's true in South Africa, as Beatrice also spoke about in Uganda, it's a tight knit community and we have more sense of community in these contexts. But at the same time, I've also worked mapping mental health crisis response pathways. I'll give you an example. My father, my family are from Libya. Now, if you tell me that in Libya, we have good mental health support, I will laugh. We have about 15 to 20 psychologists in the whole country. And that's, that's a country of six and a half million people. So there's no way that that mental health need is being met locally. All of this is just to show you that actually coronavirus is a challenge. It's to give you that contact, context. What does, it, what does it mean? Where does it leave us? I think it's just to recognize the gravity of the issue. Now, Beatrice spoke about compassion as one of the things that they had learned from the HIV response. And I think it's the most important thing when we can think of when we're thinking about our own self-care, our own mental health as well. It's about providing compassion to those who are acting out their fight response in the supermarket. It's about providing compassion to those who are unable to work at this time, who are feeling the stress and feeling the pressure but I think most importantly, the importance of compassion at this time, it's about showing compassion to ourselves. It's about showing compassion to ourselves and understanding that all of us are going through conflict. We're going through a lockdown. We're going through an extremely stressful situation and being kind to ourselves. So the World Health Organization has released some information about how you can cope with stress during the COVID outbreak. And they recognize that this is a very normal response like I've spoken about as well. They talk about the importance as Dr. Evelyn said about maintaining a healthy lifestyle, about avoiding smoking, alcohol or drugs at this time, about the importance of educating yourself and getting the facts and limiting the time that you spend on social media, watching all of this fear spread. Now, my auntie is a trauma counselor and she came up with this model in terms of how we can build our own resilience in the face of a traumatic event. And it's the respect model. And the idea is that each of us can create our own toolkit to manage what is a traumatic event. So she talked about the 
the importance of respect. So the importance of relaxing. So taking time out and doing what it is that relaxes you. So maybe it's reading a book. She talked about the importance of education. So understanding the stress cycle and then also identifying it within yourself. So when I am stressed, I can feel that I am doing this. She talked about the importance of social connections. So spending time with loved ones, and if you can't in person, then calling them on the phone. She spoke about the importance of being physical, watching what you eat and what you put into your body, good nutrition. The importance of exercise, which again is just to further iterate what Dr. Evelyn spoke to us about. Go and go for a walk. And the importance of being creative. Spending time with things that activate your, your right brain. So reading, writing, painting. And she spoke about finally the importance of thinking and trying to, to challenge some of the negative thoughts. Because when we're stressed or when we're in a stress situation and a stress response, we are gonna have some of the following thoughts. I'm not coping, I'm not good enough, I am powerless. A common thinking pattern at this time will be um, something bad is gonna happen to me or my family. I'm not in control. This is never going to end. And all of these are healthy, uh, normal responses to what is a conflict situation. At the same time, they're not necessarily helpful thoughts. She recommends that you write down your thoughts and you write a counter argument to each of them and try and rationalize that thinking. But I think for me personally, the most important thing at this time is that we must be kind and show each other compassion. So we need to recognize this is a conflict situation. We're at war. We can't expect other people to do all of the same things that they did before, but also we can't expect ourselves to. So just to be kind to each other and to be kind to yourselves. So thank you so much for listening. It's now my absolute honor to introduce Mrs. Patience Ami Mamata. And Mrs. Patience is the Ashaiman Municipality Director of Health Services in Accra, Ghana. Patience has over 20 years of experience within the health sector with clinical management and public health. And she has been leading district and municipal health teams since 2012. Patience is gonna be finishing our conference with her presentation, which is titled COVID-19, A View from Ghana, Myth Busting and the Story from a Vulnerable Urban Setting. Thank you. Am I on now? Yes, you're on. Wow. This has been great. Dr. Evelyn, Beatrice, Gloria, and Yasmin. Great, 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 great time. Yes, taking it from where Yasmin ended. Thinking of challenging negative thoughts. The Bible says in Psalm 91 verse 1, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. I use these scriptures to in fact apply respect. So as we are aware, coronavirus has been a big challenge in the world late 2019 in China. Ghana happened to report its first case on 20th of March, but prior to that, we've been engaged in holding, sensitizing the communities, uh, various stakeholders being engaged, both private sector, 
the government sector, etc. Ashama municipality basically is, uh, as I said, a very vulnerable urban setting. Ashama houses uh, most uh, indigenous from the West African sub region and almost every part in Ghana. I would be surprised if uh, Apostle or Dr. Evelyn would tell me they don't know anybody in Ashama. You can always relate to somebody or connect to somebody in Ashama. So Ashama is a very busy place with a very high population. So the government response has been in various folds, and uh, the president initially announced of about 100,000 million Ghana cities that was going to be uh, helping in the response because this needed a lot of uh, resources, both financial, PP, etc. There's been a series of uh, actions like banning, workshop, conferences, funerals, etc. There's been closing of the ports and harbors but only uh, open to essential cargo. And on the ground, we kept on working. We kept on uh, engaging the communities, engaging, I mean, sensitizing, educating, and putting in place all needed structures. The health sector, we have tried, we've done contact tracings and continued in the state. There's been enhanced contact tracing Health professionals have been called from the from the field. I mean, those who are off uh, on leaves and in schools were called to join. Uh, it has been production of personal protective equipment, mapping of hotspots, of course, in the country. And Ashaman, uh, being with our typical uh, features, were one. There's been highlights of this whole response. I'm giving this background so that we could situate the myths around COVID-19 in the municipality. So there's been the outbreak in the fish processing factory in Tema, where 695 persons were infected. In fact, most of those uh, who were affected were residents in Ashaiman. There has been the issue of convicted inmates from the police cells who were to be transported to prisons to start serving their prison sentences and screening among them. We saw very high levels of positivity rate for COVID and health staff um, testing positive etc not only in Ashaiman but also elsewhere and as we are aware the current case count for the country stands at about 16,000 uh, with 103 uh, deaths. Unfortunately Ashaiman municipality has shared in some of these deaths including the just yesterday we losing one of our very experienced surgeons to COVID-19. But what has been one of the very big challenges in responding to COVID in Ashama municipality, it's been the myth or the false idea about this whole situation we find ourselves in. There are those who believe that in fact, there is nothing like COVID. They are so adamant. They said there is no virus called COVID-19. It is a fabricated uh, a scam and it's been supported by the technocrats like myself and the health team just to get monies for the politicians to run their campaigns. You know, we are in election year in Ghana. Some also believe, I mean, with the meat. The other one is that the disease COVID-19 is for the rich people and being in a very vulnerable urban setting where, I mean, people are struggling to survive daily. In fact, 
we don't even have, most of us don't have passport. We don't know where passport office is. We don't know where the airlines pass or the, uh, the flights go and come. So you cannot tell us that we will get COVID-19. As such, whatever you are telling them about preventive behavior, some will not take it up. Some believe that, yes, there is COVID. However, when I drink Akweteshi, Akweteshi is a locally brewed gin or spirit in Ghana with a lot of other, uh, I would say, derivatives. So others believe that when I drink Akweteshi, it will kill the virus. Whilst others also think that, oh, when I wrap alcohol on my, uh, my body, as in the methylated spirit or put bleach in my bathing water, some actually apply into their nostrils, hand sanitizers. So even as you, you yes, so there is COVID, they believe. However, when you put hand sanitizer into your nostrils, it will kill the virus. There are those who also believe in the virus, once you get it, it stays with you forever. So as such, when somebody is tested positive and when we are making arrangements to transport that person to designated national case management centers, and we have to manage these people at a local health facility within the community, the community members will not agree because they believe that once somebody gets a virus and you keep the person there, a positive person temporarily, the whole community is also going to be infected. So you are putting them at risk. So they needed support, they wouldn't give the, 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 the pickets are in front of a chief's compound few, few weeks ago because they wouldn't allow us to even, you know, keep clients in there to be taken to the next level. Some believe when you walk in the sun or you bath in the sea, it will build your immunity and it will also take away the virus from you. Others think that the only people who can be affected by the virus is the elderly or people who are old. As such, the young ones will not take any help, uh, prevent, preventive behavior, you will not observe social or physical distancing, they wouldn't wear masks because they don't see themselves as being at risk. And above all, some also believe that Oh, COVID-19 is there, but the government has given us, us in the healthcare workers, a lot of money to be given to them and their families. So when they get infected, they will be able to assess those funds. So as such, when you call somebody who tests positive and you break the news to them, they will then the first thing they will ask you is not what can we do to prevent our families from, or our friends, or further spread, or get healed from this, but, but rather, uh, where, how much are you giving us? How much money is coming? Uh, I need this for my wife. I need this for my husband. These are all parts of the myths and the misinformation surrounding COVID-19 response in the municipality or in a shaman here. But what are some of the things that we've been able to do or interventions we've put in place? We've been able to gradually build trust and confidence, uh, especially with the rapid response team and the clients and the community. So as we build their confidence, they are now able to you know, get more educated on the condition, the treatment path, the pre preventive behaviors expected of them, and also supporting uh, the, the fight against further community spread. We've also been able to pass the meat by strong public-private partnerships and cooperations. We've, we've, we've worked very closely um, 
with, with, with the CEO, the assembly members, the community structures, tribal heads, to, to be able to win them so they equally have become advocates for us uh, to uh, engage communities on our behalf, even as we take other aspects of the response. Risk communication effectively has been one of our major interventions as well. So as we communicate with the communities on COVID-19, we've been able to uh, effectively communicate their risks to them as well as to give them the cues needed for positive health action. And this has been working well. We've highly, uh, as I said, mobilized other stakeholders and teamwork has been, has been won. And above all, using some of the recovered uh, COVID-19 clients uh, to help us bust some of the myths. Because uh, those who do not believe that the condition exists, we have this um, particular community within the municipality. We've seen an upsurge in, in cases within that community. And once we've been able, uh, one of the recovered persons who we've been able to effectively work with, he comes back and he's able to tell them that, now look at me, although you didn't see me for some time, I was away, I was part of those who went there, I have seen it with my naked eyes, and this is how the disease is. I've been there, I've seen people die. So don't think COVID-19 it's not real, you know? And the other thing uh, is that in, in, in Ghana and for uh, Ashaman, for example, we, uh, uh, some also think that, okay, so as we were seen on TV when it started in Wuhan and also in Italy, in parts of the other uh, parts of the world, uh, people dying, they were showing dead bodies on, once that wasn't happening on Ghanaian TV screens, it means that people were not dying from COVID. But as I've just told you, we have lost people even from the municipality uh, to COVID. So when we use some of this recovered uh, uh, clients of uh, COVID-19, they are able to help us to bust the means that some of the community members have. But how have we been able, aside that, to, to survive? I, I have a, a team that uh, we, we, we encourage each other, just as the Bible says we should, uh, 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 David encourage himself in the Lord. So we, we remain very courageous and we keep up the faith, you know, uh, because uh, the Bible says that uh, th this is what uh, overcomes the world, even our faith. So, so we, 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 we keep our faith in God as we play our, our roles. We, we, we are very hopeful and, 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 and we, we, we become like the Joshua's of our time. Because at times, just as I, I, I said in my opening remark, it can be very, very challenging mentally, as uh, Yasmin uh, just alluded to. It be very, very challenging when you, you, you see people, I mean, succumbing to the COVID-19. And this, uh, as I was saying yesterday, it's, this is somebody, a very renowned surgeon with years of skill and qualification has positively touched a lot of lives. And of course, he was a Christian, but he is gone. He's gone to COVID, we've lost him to COVID. But we use the word of God to encourage ourselves. And as we keep going, uh, uh, I mean, on this journey, living all to God. But as I, was, I, I always say, we, we, we shouldn't be ignorant or naive. We have to keep on updating our knowledge and not just taking things for granted. We have the WHO sites, et cetera, that we go to. In Ghana, 
the Ministry of Health Ghana Health Service has a dedicated site for knowledge sharing on the disease condition, etc. As such, COVID, as we are aware, can affect every, I mean, can affect anybody of any age, whether you are a Christian, whether you are non Christian, traditionalist, whatever. COVID affects everybody. COVID affects every professional. Currently, I have about 20 of my staff who have tested positive. So COVID is real. But as Christians, we continue to trust God for his divine intervention. But we must also adapt healthy behaviors to protect ourselves and also to protect our families. We have to adhere strictly to the protocols, the preventive protocol. They've been mentioned already and all the other supportive behavior that we have to adapt to help us. The physical and social distancing, the cough etiquette, eating healthy, Dr. Evelyn, etc. spoke about it. Keeping, I mean, being physically active, uh, stay at home if you can, avoid hugging and shaking of hands, wear your mask when you're going out, etc. Do you feel you are not feeling well, especially in Ghana? You can call the emergency line 112 or the COVID 19 tracker app will help you and you will be hooked. To, to, to needed care and support. To conclude, I, I want to say that above all, we're looking onto Jesus Christ, the altar and the finisher of our faith. And Psalm 91 verse seven says that a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee there shall no evil befall thee, verse 10 says, neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling place. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all their ways. So let's be encouraged, but we must know that COVID-19, for now it is with us. Research is still ongoing, as Dr. Evelyn said, Vaccines are not yet in, a lot of efforts are on the way, but till then, we must keep our fingers crossed, keep on trusting the Lord, and also do what we have to do. Keep up the faith because this pandemic will surely pass. Thank you very much and stay blessed. Thank you very much, James. And this pandemic will certainly, this too shall pass. We this know that too shall surely pass. <laughs> certainly. So we'd like to thank Beatrice and Gloria and um, Madam Patience and Yasmin. Um, so for the next few minutes that we've got, because I think this is meant to be finishing soon. Are there any questions at all? Because I've had a quick look in the chat. Um, I can't see anything, but we're looking at, you know, at any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask. And if you wanted to have any particular, you know, uh, panelists, you, you can direct them particularly, or if it's a general question, we'll see whether we all can, can chip in. So any questions? Whilst we think about it. Norman, I don't know whether you're trying to ask a question we can't hear. Michael, are you trying to ask a question? No? Yes, hello, my name is Michael. Okay, yes. Hello. Yes, go on. Yeah, with uh, Shyman, and then uh, I'm so impressed with the yeah, I'm so impressed with the presentation coming from uh, Madam um, Patient Mam, uh, Mamata on the Ashaiman situation. And but I want to find out what 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 is um, the level of the health um, directorate in terms of ensuring that people adhere to the 
various protocols because when you go through the Shaman Township, it looks like um, a lot of the safety protocols have been thrown out, especially when you walk through the market. And um, the level of education with regards to the situation in terms of safety protocols and ensuring that people adhere to them. What is the level of education and interaction, especially with the people, especially in the market area? Madam Patience, it's up, up to you. Okay. Should I, should I, okay, I, I should just respond. Yeah, yes, yes, please respond because you are the best. I mean, I know a shaman, but I've got no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so you, you, yes. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Michael. Michael, right? Yes, it was yes, my yes. Your, your, your friend, Michael. Okay, hi, hi, hello, Michael. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much for that question. Yes, we've, we've been engaging the community, the assembly, the all other stakeholders on continuous basis on the social and behavior change communication uh, interventions, being, being, I mean, wearing of masks, uh, observing social distancing, etc. You know, um, these behaviors are new in quotes to us, especially wearing of masks. So people are catching it up slowly. The, the, a lot has been achieved, but a lot more needs to be done. We've been in link uh, uh, with all the other stakeholders, as I've said. So it, it's, it's, it's a continuous process. We are not yet there yet. It's a continuous process. So I'm happy Action Plus is organizing this forum and you are here. We, we as I said, other stakeholders have been involved with us, but uh, it's a process and everyone else must come on board to, to, to encourage all to wear the mask so that I'm protected and you are protected. But I must say that when you enter into the um, the government, the, so as in the official establishment, the protocols are, are, are best, uh, how do you call it, especially wearing of masks, washing of hands, you wouldn't enter any banking hall, uh, official building within the municipality largely, even in, in some shops, I mean, mostly without being in your marks and also washing of your hands, etc. But it's a process. It, it, a lot more needs to be done, especially around the market square. Okay, so let me please use this opportunity to just book an appointment um, tomorrow, maybe within the week for an interview to tell some of the success story that uh, the municipality is, is, is um, doing with you, maybe within the week. Madam okay, Patient. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> always at your service. <laughs> I know, I know. You've always been available for us. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I'm grateful. <laughs> Thanks for your question and, and the, the lovely answer, Madam Patience. We got any more questions? Any burning questions? Oh, yes. Okay, go on, Norman. Uh, this is Norman from Uganda. Yes. Uh, I would love to know how best we, we, you know, we can ensure human rights and reduce stigma and discrimination among our people, you know, first by COVID-19 in our communities. Okay. Um, I, I don't know, Beatrice and Gloria, is it one of you able to um, um, answer this question? Yeah, I don't mind us, um, answering. Yeah, I think one of the important things is education. I believe a lot of stigma comes from miseducation and people are really misinformed about a lot of topics. So the more we um, make sure that we have education within communities, um, we're talking about COVID-19, um, those are the kind of things that would re reduce the stigma because you've got a lot of things like fake news, you know, on platforms like WhatsApp, Facebook, you have a lot of misinformation being spread, which increases stigma. 
because stigma comes from a, a place of lack of knowledge you know they don't know the diff um, people don't know um something so you know that's where stigma comes from but if we encourage education and make sure that people are aware of of the correct information i believe that's one of the things that can reduce it beatrice do you have anything to add no, I, I just agree with that the problem with the stigma is that it stops us from getting the facts and actually makes the problem a lot worse so all of us as individuals for you what you have learned today if you have avenues for taking the education further or reaching out to people who are actually doing the education then you get in touch and we can help to kind and then link you with people who can help you with the education bit but i think that's our best tool that we have creating the awareness and making people understand like the doctors have said COVID, and we all know that covid impacts everybody and anybody it does not discriminate so it's better for us to equip ourselves with the knowledge as opposed to pointing fingers at other people okay Okay, can I share um, some thoughts as well uh, from my shaman, please? Yes, you wanted, sorry, you want to share something. Go ahead, um, Malibu. Yes, okay, thank you, Dr. Evelyn. Um, Make it short, please, because I think yes, we're right. So for my shaman, I'm of, of tackling issues of human rights uh, within COVID, uh, COVID response has to start right away from when the sample is being taken for testing. Because we, you have to explain to the clients, we were initially using uh, the nasopharyngeal, we switched to sputum sampling. So you have from the word go, the, the, the client must know that you are, I'm, I'm taking, health staff must explain that I'm taking your sample for so so and so and when the results come uh, you should be able to communicate directly to only that person who is positive or negative so you don't go infringing on his or her right because we've had instances that the wife uh, a wife is positive but she says don't when when i call or when i call I say don't tell my husband I, or, or you have to ask, can I tell my husband? Or I don't want my husband to know. And there are times the, the number on the phone, the contact is a husband's number. And you kept calling. But once he or she doesn't give you the uh, uh, authority to talk to the partner about the person's call, you, you just can't disclose. You have to talk to um, uh, the person through it. And you, so you have to keep the confidentiality. You don't share the personal information with any other person. And also when uh, they have to be taken to case management center, because for Ghana, we have designated ambulances that uh, carry positive cases to um, treatment centers. And there are times with the ambulance, the sirens blazing, and people are not very comfortable with that. So I, 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 we have to find a very subtle way of uh, maybe can we meet at this street corner, uh, just get out of your house, we don't get in there, uh, meet me there, then we jump into the ambulance that they are gone. So the confidentiality uh, and the rights of the individual client is, is maintained in that uh, regard. And some go and come back and nobody knows they've gone and they are back. So I, I think these are some of the, the ways we are trying to work within the human rights, um, COVID and human rights. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Madam Patience. I've got another question from Trick to, this will be to Gloria and Beatrice, yes? So my question, yeah. and it's in the chat, so I'm going to read it out. So yes, my question is for posit, uh, Positive East speakers. How are they helping the disadvantaged in their community in this time? Are there any support groups in place? For example, food banks? I cannot use my mic during this time, but my question is in written form. So yes, how, how are we helping the disadvantage in, in, in this community and any supporting groups? Gloria? Yeah, uh, 
I, I have seen the, the question during this COVID time, what we've actually done, because for us, our clients are specific. We work with clients, people who are living with HIV. So those ones are registered and we've been doing check-in calls with them because some of them live alone and they're isolated and that. And in the process, exactly one of the reasons was checking out if people had enough supplies in terms of like medication and food. And we are linked to some food banks across the different areas in East London. And we will, we will make a referral and people will receive food banks. And then like those who need like other help services or whether it's counseling, we still offer that online. And then for people who need some we try to get them like minor grants and things like that. But we, we do offer food banks based on other partner agencies that do that locally. Okay. Um, did you want to add any anything at all, Gloria, or are you good? You, you're muted, Gloria. Sorry, I think, I think Beach has covered everything. You know, we have um, support in place for people living with HIV. Um, if they also acquire COVID-19 during this period, that we also support them where we can. As she mentioned with the food banks, shopping. Um, our, you know, our check-ins, we've got um, activities online. Um, and we also have a good network of, of other partner and organisations that support us as well. So Thank we work you. with a big network. Thank you. All right. So I'm on to the chat again, because for, if you're on a mobile, I don't think you can, you, can, you can read the chat. So I'm going to read one more. So my concern, um, and this is from Galaxy Tab A, I don't know who you are. My concern is there should be much more effort put on churches to follow protocols to avoid spread of the virus. And it says, thank you. So it's not a question, it's, that's his concern. So if there's pastor, you know, even, you know, to all the church people and the pastors that we, um, um, we, follow the protocol so we, we we're not as a hot spot for or for spreading the virus because it's not nice if you wake up one morning to say so so and so church you know it's got a hot spot and there's you know they're spreading the virus so please let us stick to the rules like i'm saying where i am we're going to be meeting at home for a very long time because there's a lot of old people in my church and we sing a lot because i'm in the salvation army we sing a lot so my no church for me for a long time because of that but any more questions any more? Okay. Uh, oh, yes, please. All right. So, Norman, Norman, you'll be the last one, then go on. All right. Uh, uh, this is Norman again. I would love, you know, to shed more light about the use of gloves in the community, you know, in the prevention and, you know, transmission of COVID-19, because when you hear to some other healthy experts, they tell you uh, washing hands is more safer than even wearing gloves. So... Uh, I mean, right. any advice, please? Um, Mad uh, Madam Patience, what do you do in Ghana, glove-wise? What's your advice? Um, sorry, we, we do not, um, in, in community social settings, we, we do not encourage no wearing of gloves because we rather see that as uh, rather spreading the virus because at the end of the day, you, the individual, you might be protecting yourself by wearing the gloves. But from one surface to other, you are touching. You are. You might if if that gloves is contaminated, you might rather end up spreading the virus more or, or endangering more lives, as well as also having. You could also end up having that false sense of protection yourself. So we, we do not, I mean, I think for, for three reasons, those that I've mentioned already. And also, I mean, gloves are to be used in certain clinical settings. It's best to wash your hands. I mean, the hand washing is the best. Wash your hands frequently, at least 20 seconds uh, and that. Uh, running water with soap rather than wearing uh, the disposable or latest gloves and keep on touching every surface you uh, you go go into a shop you pick this item you check it you leave it you pick you know it, it it rather puts a lot more people at risk so it is not advised currently 
Okay. So, and, and for us here in the UK as well. Um, Thank uh, you. Yes, th thanks, Madam Patience. Here in the UK, definitely when you're going out, definitely the mask, because there, there's a lot yeah. of people that, that would help. Gloves. You don't see too many, although they, you know, they said to wear gloves, you don't see too many people in the shops and stuff like that with gloves. Yeah. The important thing is to wash your hands when you get yes. home. Like uh, Madam Patience has said, 20 seconds under running water with soap. Yeah. 20 seconds. If it means you're standing there watching the clock, do. That's the, that is the advice. If you are a high risk group, I will say try and wear the gloves. If you're a high risk group, if you work in a, you know, if you work in healthcare, obviously you have to, you know, you have to wear the, you have to wear the, the gloves. Yeah. I think that the, the mask and the hand washing minimum will be the one. Okay. I don't know if anybody else, but somebody else might have some other ideas here on the platform. If you do, you can unmute yourself. I don't know, Gloria, Beatrice, I don't know if you do have, you don't have to say anything, but if you do have, um, so if there's no more questions, um, I think we shall uh, end. Um, please, my, mine is about the stigmatization. Uh, yeah, mine is about people who have been infected and are okay now, are feeling better, but they are being stigmatized in the society, especially in Africa. What do we do about that? Because of they don't have enough knowledge about the sickness and so they stigmatize people who have been infected and are well again. Madam Patient, you don't have to land on your desk. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Evelyn. Yes, stigmatization is not good. Stigmatization kills. And um when you, as much as possible, we have to prevent stigma. Uh, as I said, for Ashama, we are putting this intervention, so stigmatization is, is minimal. However, should you find yourself or a loved one in that situation, please link up with the healthcare officials within that district or the municipality. They will help. Um, I have had instances that there are recovered or cured COVID-19 clients from discharge from treatment centers, and they are to go back to their places of work, and the HR manager will tell me that, oh, uh, director, why don't, don't you think uh, he should stay at home for another two, three weeks before coming? And it's when there's knowledge is scarce, I mean, people are afraid. So it leads to stigmatization. So there are professionals that are within the healthcare team, the health promotion officers, the, uh, even the community mental health in my municipality, we are using all the public health team who are able to explain I mean, well, scientifically to these people to support the integration of the stigmatized ones into their communities or into their, 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 their society. So they, they, there's a lot of help you can get from the healthcare team wherever you have uh, someone who is suffering from stigmatization. At times you have to link out with the community, maybe the a, a, a landlords association to get to the landlady to, to explain one on one that this person has tested negative at least twice before our new protocol for COVID-19, but you probably have not even tested once. Yes. So this person is in a better position than you. And it's, it's, it's all about the myth that once you get infected with COVID, it, the infection remains with people forever. So even when they, they are recovered and they are bad, people, even at the workplace, they don't want to deal with them. But um, we have a lot of support that we give to whoever might be uh, finding him or herself in this situation. So please, I think uh, the one who has the question is Nana. Any district you are in, you can, you can contact the health staff. They, they, they will help. 
they will help the person because we do have database of everybody who has you know gone through this to treatment center home care whatever so they will they will really help can i uh, just add to that as well thank you so much patience i think um because you were yes. saying about um people who test you know this person now your protocol is they must test negative at least two times um, and I'll just give you yeah, a, that, a was, that was the former protocol yeah. we had. So my husband, I told you, he recently was in an accident. And when he presented at hospital, now you do a COVID test in South Africa. And he tested positive for COVID. But we would never have mm -hmm. known. He was completely asymptomatic. And actually, he cleared it within two weeks. But that's kind yeah. of just to, to add to that in terms of COVID in particular. With, Thank you. We just won't know, actually, in, some, in the majority of cases. Um, and I just think when we're talking about stigma, it's really it's our responsibility as individuals, as people who are here today to challenge that actively and to stand on yeah. platforms and to talk because I think stigma lives in silence. So as long as we yeah. are talking about COVID and we are challenging it wherever we find it, then I think we're on the right path. And I just want to once again thank Beatrice for what she did today with the HIV piece because I think it's activists and advocates like Beatrice, like Gloria, like all of us who will challenge the stigma and all of us and each and every one of us can do this. So thank you again, Beatrice. Thank you, Patience. So yes, thank you. Lovely, lovely answer. Did you want to add on, Beatrice? Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, with, with regard to the stigma, we're all aware that it's based on fear, ignorance. So that goes to show that we need to invest a lot in education. What Apostle Fred has done today, what all of you have done today, getting together and having the awareness session is something that needs to happen more and more on the ground. There's no other way around it because you can protect the people who are being affected, but actually they'll remain mentally disturbed. They'll have mental problems because they're kind of like excluded but then if the wider community has the education, it means that people don't need to, to um, live a life of anxiety and fear. It kind of brings it back, because I've seen it all with the, within the HIV sector. But it's the education. We need to get down to the masses. And then anyway, when you give people education, it's a way of them protecting themselves as well. So that's going to, I know the resources may be limited, but it's definitely something to fight for as we fight the battle for COVID. Lovely answers. Um, certainly, when it comes to um, stigma, um, like we're saying, like patients are saying, which is very true, and um, Yasmin, you, there's a lot of us roaming around. We don't know whether we're positive or negative for COVID. Yeah. Certainly, certainly when um, in March, when it hit us in the NHS, and we we're all working, all the doctors, we assume we all got COVID because we had so many patients coming. We didn't know who had COVID or not. Yeah. So if you are sitting there and, you know, seeing somebody and stigmatizing the person because the person we know has had COVID and probably cleared, you could be the one carrying the COVID. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so when, you, when you're looking at somebody and thinking, oh, it's had COVID, let's stay clear. The person is, they, you know, they, they've, like, as we say in my, in my language, he's, do you understand, he's seen, he, he, he knows what he's got. Mm -hmm. but what about you? What about you? Yes, so yes. I don't know how, um, I don't know what the testing situation is like in Ghana, Nana, but just think that you could be the one that's got COVID or you could be the one spreading COVID. The other person we know has had the COVID done, sorted, dusted. But what about you? So let us think, mm. let us think when we're stigmatizing, stigmatizing that it could be yeah. us or it could be your brother or it could be your sister because we're talking a bit about love here. I think this is where love is going to come into the whole situation. That I love my neighbors myself. He's got COVID and Claire, I should be able to love the person back. Okay, all right. So I think we're done and I am far, I am very aware that we are going past that. Uh, okay. Also, Fred, if you were here, maybe it would be the time to show your face again. Yep. Okay. And uh, yes, yes, we finished the question and answer session, and I think we'll leave it to you to round, to round it up. Yeah, so um, at this point, um, I think that 
we've had a lot of information. This day has been very, very, very wonderful day. A lot of things have been spoken about. Things we didn't understand have all been, you know, analyzed. Like the hand washing thing, many people don't wash our hands. We just just forget ourselves. But we now know that you have to wash your hands and make sure that you're washing it I mean, not less than two seconds. And do that as much as you go out and come in. We also have to educate other people around us so that they will also be able to keep safe. And also we have to keep fit and healthy. And we also have to have uh, a time for ourselves to, you know, go out there, you know, jogging and exercising. And all these things give us uh, uh, the, the means of having a healthy lifestyle. Um, and that's, um, I think it was Dr. Evelyn who said that your health is your wealth. Your health is your wealth. So if you are healthy, you are also wealthy. So you can live longer because of your, your lifestyle that you have developed. And you can do that by eating much fresh fruits and vegetables. And also, um, as Yasmin was saying, we have to adapt the, res the respect model. That is also very, very important. We also heard that we should avoid stigma and show much love and compassion. Compassion is very, very, very important for us to be able to fight COVID. We have to have compassion. Think about others as you think about yourself. You also have um, a lot of power to change things. We have the power to change things. We don't wait for somebody to tell us what to do. We need to observe all the protocols and that helps us to change things. We also have heard that uh, when we work in partnership with the community advocates, and having a teamwork lifestyle, then we shall all together bring COVID to the grave, as we have called it, ice on COVID-19. We want to stop COVID once and for all. So God bless you. And without wasting much time, I'm going to ask our sister Grace Afi, our PRO in Ghana, to say a very big thank you to our presenters and speakers. And then she will tell us um, all that we, we have to know for this week, announcement, and for that, we finish up with a prayer from Sister Nana, and then our mom, Pastor Florence, will give us the grace, and then we will close for the day. So now, Grace, if you are there, we are waiting. Well, look as if Grace is not here. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is what she would have done. She would just say, thank you so much for, you know, the good presentation that you did today. <laughs> it's, it's very uh, uh, heartwarming heart thing. And um, I believe that uh, um, we have taken in enough. And so you also have to go and have your rest, rest and then, you know, get your strength back. We believe that Next time when we call on you, you respond as you've done today. So God richly bless you, all our speakers. You are so wonderful. We have really, 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 you know, admired your presentation. We ask that God will richly bless you with more Amen. that you'll be able to deliver throughout this COVID crisis. Thank you so much. God bless you. Can we now ask our sister Nana, if you are there, Nana can you just close us in prayer? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We thank God for this day. It has been a very good day, very enlightening day, educative. And then I think we all have learned something since we've joined and we are taking something home. Amen. Amen. Yes. Um, Amen. Beloved, let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for what you have done for us. This day has been a day you have made, and we rejoice and we are glad in you. We are glad that you have combined us from all walks of life and all nations, and we have talked about this very topic. We thank you for our health. We thank you for our families. We thank you for the information you have given us. We thank you for the life of everyone on this platform. We thank you so much, Father. 
we are praying that those who have been infected with COVID, we ask for recovery and we ask for healing for them in the name of Jesus. We pray for healing for the nations. We pray for the healing of the sick. We pray for the healing of those who have been affected, those who have lost loved ones. We pray that you touch families. We pray that you console families. May you plant joy in people who have sorrow. May you plant yes, happiness in people who are crying. May you wipe away the tears of those who have lost their loved ones. Yet mm. again, when we that are alive, we that are healthy, may you continue to make us healthy so we can reach out to people. May you continue to give us more information, more education mm. on this COVID. In the mighty name of Jesus, now, as you have joined this platform, as you have joined this meeting, I pray that everything that is on your heart will be fulfilled. I pray that Jesus will be with you. I pray for protection for your family. As you are protecting others, may your family also be protected. As you are thinking about others, may you also be on the mind of God. As you are planning for the betterment and the good of others, May you also enjoy the goodness and mercies of God. May the goodness and mercies follow you all the days of your life. May great peace be installed in your homes. Anyone who is yet again wants to receive